This conference will now be recorded. So hello everyone, my name is Marie-Laure Falque-Massé. I'm working for l'Institut Paris Région uh, in the Ile-de-France region, the Paris region. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank you Dominique and Melissa uh, for co-organizing this webinar. And secondly, I would like to thank you all for your participation this morning uh, in this first workshop on energy sufficiency. Uh, so this concept is both well known and mysterious, but we are going to work on it this morning. Um, Melissa, you can put next slide, maybe. Um, so we're going to ask for some questions this morning. So you have to open Slido. This is right, Melissa? Yes, exactly. So uh, we have uh, prepared a few poll questions and uh, you will be able to, to answer them through Slido. So just either you, um, you uh, take a picture of the QR code you see or you go to slido.com and uh, type this code to, to join us there. So sorry, I forgot to open my camera. So hello again, everybody. Um, so the agenda this morning, uh, just after me, we will have uh, three brilliant people um, on this uh, concept of energy sufficiency. The first one, the, our first speaker will be Nils Borg from ECEE. -E -E. Afterwards, Julien Camacho from, the, from Claire in France, the Network for Energy Transition, will present uh, the Declic program. And afterwards, Soren Hermansen from SAMSE in Denmark uh, will open the, the discussion between uh, each of us uh, on, uh, on energy sufficiency. Um, so we will have a lot of time to have an uh, exchange on this subject. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is a series of uh, webinars on energy sufficiency. So for what the first one today will be dedicated uh, to consumers and buildings. So we will we'll more focus on citizens. Uh, the next one in December, uh, please note it's on 9th December. Uh, it will be dedicated to mobility and public space, but always on energy sufficiency. And the third one next week, we will open the year on the 8th of January uh, with uh, digital sufficiency. Uh, we will see um, later, maybe, uh, or oh, no, just now. Sometimes uh, you can read or heard of about sobriety. Sobriety is an appropriate word for sufficiency, but it depends on the countries. So maybe we will have a discussion about it, or we will we can answer to, to this question maybe later. Next slide. So who is around the table today? Uh, I introduce myself. Maybe people can just say their name and uh, uh, institutions and uh, country uh, in order to see who is there, so now I give the floor to the next one, Dominique. Yes, uh, good morning to everybody. So my name is Dominique Bourg. I'm the coordinator of uh, FEDAREN, which is a European uh, network of energy agencies and regions. Next, Melissa. Uh, yeah, I'm turning on my uh, webcam quickly so you can see me. You can do the same maybe when you introduce yourself. So Melissa Miklos, colleague of uh, Dominique at Federen, and I'm a communication officer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, I'm uh, Niels Borg from Lee. I will present soon, so I think you'll see nothing me then. So happy to be here. Good morning, everybody. Julien Camacho from the Claire, uh, briefly introduced by Marie Laure before, and I'm going to do some presentation today too. So uh, I will present me again. Thank you. 
Hey, good morning, everyone. Philip here from the Federan office. I'm a project manager at uh, at uh, Federan, and uh, thanks for organizing this webinar. I'm looking forward to it. Siren. So next. Soren, are you there? Not maybe. I'm here, yes. Yeah. So I'm, Just I'm here from Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm here from Samsung Energy Academy and uh, and talking from, from a local practical implementation place. Um, I'll take it from there. Thank you. Um, Melissa, I don't know who is connected really this uh, morning. Yeah, I'm trying to look at the, at the list uh, at the same time because obviously not, not everyone is there. Um, but maybe we can go. Uh, I, I saw two other Federan colleagues, so Yasmin and Clemence, can you also introduce yourself? Um, yeah, I, I can start if you want. Um, I'm Yasmin, I'm a, an intern in communication at Federen, uh, and I'm happy to uh, attend to this webinar, so thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Clémence, uh, I'm also a colleague uh, at Federen office and I'm a project manager. Thank you both. Uh, I see in the list we have Marco, so we can maybe uh, take the order we have on screen. So we first have Marco and then uh, let's see. Marco, you have to open your switch on your microphone, please. Otherwise, we can go straight to Neriman Ozer. Are you here? Yes, he's there, but maybe people are shy this morning. If you have issues with your uh, microphone or uh, webcam, please tell us in the chat. Otherwise, this is now Milena. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Milena Gupiana and I'm from the Energy Agency of Plovdiv. Also, I could introduce my colleague Peter Kisyok. We work um, in the sphere of uh, energy efficiency uh, in the buildings and um, uh, small and medium enterprises um, and of course in, in the sphere of air quality. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Milena. So next, Christian. Hello, uh, Christian Labi from uh, from Lyon in France. Um, I was I was working in um, Aura Auvergne Rhone Alpes Energy Environment. Now I am retired, and I was a general secretary uh, uh, delegate of Federen during a few years. Thank you. Hello, Christian. Nice to hear you. Yeah, nice to hear you. Hello, Marie-Laure, Dominique, and Federine team. Hello, hello. Uh, Maria, are you here? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Gileos. I'm from the Cyprus Energy Agency. Uh, we are mainly involved with um, activities promoting energy efficiency. Um, and energy efficiency buildings, promotion of renewable energy sources, climate mitigation and adaptation. And I'm excited for this workshop to work together with you. Thank you. Thank you. Then I think it's uh, straight to Maya. Uh, hi. Uh, 
Hello, everybody. So I am Maya Bratko from Jimmery Energy Agency. I'm a senior project manager. And thank you very much for this uh, webinar and looking forward to learning something new today. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. Alexis? Okay, let's go. Uh, Alexis is uh, Soren's colleague, as you can see, anyway. So maybe we will hear from here, from him later. Um, Todor, I don't know if he's still there. Maybe he's having issues. I don't see him in the list anymore. Yeah, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I had to share my camera with uh, with this software. Um, yeah, I'm a colleague of Soren's and project manager at the uh, Samsung Energy Academy. Um, an NGO on the island of Samsung working on the energy transition and the consequences of climate change. Okay, then in the list, I just see um, Neriman and Marco who hasn't uh, haven't spoken yet. So if you can now, otherwise we can move on, marie -Laure. Okay. So everybody had the chance to introduce himself or herself. Okay. So Neriman is saying, uh, ah, okay. Neriman has a problem with the micro and the camera. Okay, so welcome Neriman. Um, but Ma Marco is trying to get, to get the floor. Marco? Hi, everybody. I don't know if you see. Uh, Marco Zlonaga from Croatia, from Northwest Croatia Regional Energy Agency. Glad to be here to learn something new today. Thank you. Thank you. So it's okay, everybody. Thank you, everybody. So um, I hope we you succeed to connect to Slido. Uh, we have a first question for you, um, just to to warm to warm up. So where do you feel you perform the most eco gestures? Is it at home, at work, or in the public space? Oh my God, at all. It is a 100%. Um, no. You have one minute to, to vote. Oh, I didn't. I didn't vote. Yeah, eight people have voted, and we are uh, nine, nine, and we are sixteen. So don't hesitate to to do it if you haven't yet. We have to put the code e sufficiency one. Okay. I think we can we can close for this one. Uh, maybe Marie-Laure. 
Yes, 14 people have voted. Oh. So um, just in case for Slido, I, I think it's always easier to use your phone. This way you, you don't uh, touch your, your screen and you can always see the slides. So you just uh, take your phone, go to uh, the web page Slido or you already have the app or you take a picture of the image on the left uh, upper corner here for next one. So this is interesting because we are going to speak about home, about work, about the public space and so on uh, through these three webinars. And uh, this is interesting. Uh, 40, 43 percent people at home, 43 percent at work and 14 in the public space. So I think it's very interesting. Uh, I had this question, this question in, a, uh, in a former um, webinar and uh, the results were really completely different. I can remember that it was most at home. Uh, so maybe it will be interesting for our uh, speakers uh to have this in mind i take a picture of uh, the result oh thank you everybody so now now we are going to give the floor to Niels Borg for um the first presentation um this first presentation uh as the objective to demystify, uh, to understand uh, what is energy sufficiency. Um, and uh, it's a cru crucial part of the energy transition, uh, but is one that is often forgotten. Uh, so this morning we are going to discover how to no longer confuse sufficiency and efficiency. So please, Nils. Yes, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marilo. Um, so uh, let's let's see what it what the slides look like when we progress further on because it's it's very small. The big font is now very small, and the smaller font might be very tiny. So we'll see. Anyway, um, I'm happy to be here, and uh, I will try to give a short introduction on energy sufficiency, which is of course, a subject which doesn't have a really very, very clear definition. Uh, and, uh, you know, energy efficiency itself is a bit, what do we really mean sufficiency controversial in some circles and what about that is becomes even more uh, kind of difficult to kind of nail down. So um, we'll see. Huh? It doesn't, my slide doesn't change now. Oh, no. You have changed okay. it already, so, yeah. Yeah, I yes. have... oh. yeah I've, I've seen, but I, I wonder, have I changed one or two? I think that's the second one. Yeah, good. Um, so, uh, energy sufficiency is in a way about having enough, but not using too much. So uh, we we believe it goes beyond energy efficiency, uh, but energy efficiency must be an integrated part of the sufficiency concept. So it's not just to to um, where I think some people say, well, we should just use an old machine as long as we can because it's sufficient not to throw it away. It still has to be uh, a scientific and and a kind of a rational approach to when do we need to change things? So it's not just to not change it or, or just not invest. So in that, that, that's my view. Other people might have a different view, but I think it, and the efficiency, the normal and the efficiency need to be part of this. But to me, it's about doing things differently to be well uh, within the limits. But 
within uh, people who work with energy sufficiency, there's a lot of, of big and sometimes very heated debates. Do we speak about degrowth, that is actually limiting growth itself? Other people say, well, maybe it's just a different kind of growth, a better growth, um, greener growth, etc. Or others say, well, it's just about limiting excesses. Um, so, and, and, and this list can continue. The rebound is one important thing about this. So when when we save energy and money and then we spend it on other things and, and that increases consumption somewhere else, that's also part of it. And I will not stop too much on the sufficiency concept itself, but rather be speaking about how we can make this concept operational and to, to start to think a bit how we can break it down to manageable pieces. Let's see. If it changes now. So we have the donut in front of us. No. Yeah, and now there it comes. Okay, now it's two. Okay, I need to go back one step. There. So one one um, starting point is this the donut diagram, where we can say if staying in a green is safe place. And this donut uh, diagram is originally developed uh, by Kate Raworth, who works at Oxfam and also linked to the University of Oxford, where this idea is about having, uh, let's say, a, a, a board or a ribbon where you stay inside. That's, let's say, the, the limits, the outer limits, these are the various kind of, of uh, impact we do on the environment, on the ecosystem, uh, like climate change, freshwater use, uh, land use change, all those things that, that are important for our kind of long-term um, survival or long-term living condition for us as a race or as a humanity. Inside, it's about you can't shrink too much because you also need to feel that it's not just poverty. And, and if you go inside there, this is a way to try to show that you need a certain amount of water, food, health, income, education, etc. So this is a way to show that there are limits, but it's not just limits uh, about growing, it's just it's also limits about shrinking too much. And that's an important thing to remember that, and, and I think we need to bring this image with us when we speak about uh, climate change and, and adaptation, because we also want to make sure it's, uh, we have kind of equal or, or, or a just transition. And I think this is an important part of that. Um, when we speak about sufficiency uh, and limits, because it's about limits, so tight is a way. You know, we the, this this uh, little uh, necklace with with the five colors. Some people think, well, it's definitely political suicide. You can't speak about it. And other are more well, it's too limiting. Uh, you have to think about other things. Um, other can move and say, well, it's it's you can speak about it, but it's too difficult, you can't work with it in, in a policy term. Other think about it as sharing and, and let's say the positive narrative about this is to living well within the limits, to say well, there are limits, but we can still have a good life inside them. And there are a number of various, uh, in, in different countries, this is an example from the UK where there was a report about net zero um, and how UK can do it. and it actually is somewhere about in, in the middle there. Of, it's about sharing. Uh, it's not completely over to the right, but it's also uh, acknowledging it is very difficult. So this is a way to show a bit on where you can think about it in policy terms. But actually, if we think about limits, the whole discussion about climate change is actually uh, also about limits. I mean, we, we, we have a limited amount of greenhouse gases. We have a very clear carbon budget. So 
even whether we like it or not, we are speaking about limits. Very much when people speak about energy efficiency, they speak about it in the view of improving energy intensity. It's just about improving energy intensity, but you cannot think about a limit of energy consumption. That thought is still very prevailing. You, people are in general in many, many economists and many uh, politicians or policymakers say, well, yes, we can improve, uh, you know, let's say, the, the ratio of energy uh, related to our, uh, you know, our, grow, our, our GDP or anything like that. But we cannot speak about limiting energy use because that is about limiting <clears throat> development. But we do today speak about actually an absolute level of carbon. Uh, emissions, although we don't, uh, let's say we haven't turned it all into policy. So I think the concept of limits is gaining ground a lot because we know, and, and I think this is a good, it's in a way the same circle. There is a limit, limited space. You cannot go outside of this realistically. Although some people dream about, yeah, we can go somewhere else, we can colonize somewhere else on other planets, but realistically, this is. The limits we have, the physical limits. <clears throat> we have been running a project within ECGPLE for uh, four years now uh, about energy sufficiency. We have generated a number of reports. We have had a number of uh, national workshops uh, on different topics. So in that sense, I'd say they they are. Uh, not every national workshop, we have tried the same ideas. We have done something or more on transportation in UK. We had a French one, which was very, uh, let's say, cross-cutting. We had another one more on buildings, etc. So, and these have also, we have four, let's say, policy papers. One is an introduction. We have one on buildings and on product policy and on uh, uh, rebound. And then we have the uh, the, uh, the various national workshop reports as well. Uh, one thing, let's see. So, uh, if we think about energy sufficiency, I think this is a good illustration of one dilemma when we have, let's say, eco design standards or something. We have a linear efficiency. We put requirements on TVs, but at the same time, TVs get bigger so in absolute numbers we may be saving or we may but not at all as much as we could be saving if we were capturing the technical potential because we kind of cash that in we change it into a bigger appliance or or more services uh, this is of course an extreme tv today i don't maybe it's not extreme in in, in, a, in a number of years so Progressive standards is one uh, approach to this. So it looks into, for instance, TVs, um, but and, and and they link this to rebound. They say, well, it's no idea to have more efficient because we just cash this in or we change it into more consumption, then we are lost again. But if we do the policy decisions in a more conscious way, we can counter very much of this rebound. And uh, um, uh, one example is another example is washing machines. They uh, the measurement standards made it easier to to build uh, an A triple rated seven kilo machine than a four kilo machine because it was also full load. Now that has been changed, so it's it's more realistic load, which means that a very big machine actually is not as easy to make super uh, A rated. Um, refrigerators is about the same thing. The more, uh, the bigger you have, it's easier to to get the and the efficiency rating. But of course, a very very large refrigerator, if it's too big, will actually mean you consume more energy, even if you have a very, I'd say, AAA rated. So progressive standards is one part. And what do I mean with progressive standards? Um, See something happens. No, try again. Ah, here. Yeah. So this is um, it's a bit old, but I think it's very good. It shows 
various uh, oh. so now it's going away. Yes, so it shows different uh, TV standards and TV performance in the US in, in 2010 and 12. But uh, let's see. no, oh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, there's something that disappeared. Um, if you see the bottom yellow line, um, that's a new Energy Star 5.0 standard, which was introduced in 2012. You see that this yellow curve is linear, but it has a break in the middle uh, where you look at the power certain screen area in the bottom, which means that after a certain size of the TV, it flattens out. So yeah, you can build bigger TVs, but you, but the standard doesn't allow these TVs to consume more energy. So this is a way where you can, through a policy decision, through a standard or a performance requirement, actually say you, you can't, you don't want to forbid people to have bigger TVs. But if you want to have a bigger TV, if you want to build a bigger TV as a manufacturer, you have to uh, make it more. Uh, so uh, relatively much, much more efficient. Uh, there are various ways of doing this. I can be, a, this has it like a knee, there are so, uh, soft curves, but the, the idea is the same that with a progressive standard, you don't allow things to become bigger. With cars, it's a similar thing, similar problem with SUVs. Uh, as you know, they have, oh, they've been growing a lot and um, uh, the, the the market share of SUVs. Let's see if it happens again. No, it has been growing a lot. And one problem with this is they partly in some countries are in different classes, which means that if you have car standards that limit the amount, uh, for instance, you have these corporate standards, how much car makers can can sell and, and their average um, fuel efficiency or average carbon emissions, then they have instead changes into SUVs. So this is a, a problem which is hard to get and you have a very strong um, trend towards that. But if you look at, for instance, it doesn't have to be in, if you take like New York City, there is an example where uh, it's a third of all public transport passenger miles in the US. I'm not sure now if the rest of the text is there. But, but it has a, a very small share of the energy consumption. So it's, it's, it's very uh, little of, of this uh, still. So, so it means that you can shift to different mode. And that's also something where you would say, where I would say energy sufficiency takes, uh, but if you go one step forward and you can see this is why, why uh, uh, this is an image I borrowed from my wife, who's a city planner, and, and where they looked on concepts for a new part of the city, where you have different, it illustrates how easy it should be to move. So bike and walking should be very straight, very easy. Maybe buses, you, you will have to move, walk a bit to catch a bus, and having a car, you might first have to go somewhere for instance, you wouldn't necessarily allow people to park in front of, of their house. These are for multifamily housing. You had to go somewhere else. So you don't allow, which means that the competitive advantage of having a car is not so strong anymore. So these are to build a structure to allow for sufficiency and you build it in the structure from the beginning. Uh, buildings is, is uh, in a way a similar thing where you can build a structure uh, where you can make, if you design buildings correctly, you can still have a fan that uh, moves air and make it make a cool breeze. But this means that you have to make sure the building doesn't get too hot in the day, so you can still have it. The other option is to you're forced to have simply a bearable uh, conditions is to have a lot of air conditions like this the the right image, and that's again where you can, we have to look at the building design. It's not about the designing the city now, but how to design the buildings. But if 
if you want to have the building, you also need to have silent streets. You can open the windows. So again, it becomes. So uh, one thing is, of course, energy performance of houses, uh, the rating is again linear definitions. If it's 100 square meter home or 1,000 square meter home, it can still be a super good or super bad. But a very, very efficient 1,000 square meter home will still use a lot of energy. So there is an important challenge to define and find ways to limit consumption, to limit the size, or at least the, how we use the floor space more efficiently. For instance, how many live in a home? How do we define that in the building standards? This is very, very difficult. And I don't have a good answer for that. But one thing is, for instance, that taxation should not encourage very large homes. Uh, we need flexibility to, to um, for instance, make sure one house can be used for one thing in one part of life. When the kids move out, maybe you can quickly change the house so you can make another apartment and, and let that to somebody else. Or it's there is uh, other attractive apartments for older people to move to, so a bigger family can move into that house. So there's a lot of things and a lot of different kind of legislation and planning that is needed at the same time in order to achieve this. And I think just a few notes on what we can do in local, national, international area. And so in the local area, I think collective action is, is, is important and we can try to enable change such as city planning, which is really most parts of the world owned by the local communities, by the municipalities that can decide how do you want to build, how do you want to shape the structures, how, what do you want to invest in terms of public transport and so on. Um, in national level, I think there is a way of, of um, somehow formally accept that there has to be limits on energy consumption and carbon emissions. Uh, there are, of course, sim uh, similar limits needed for other kinds of emissions too. And um, some things where we know it will be hard to get people changed just by changing behavior, we may need regulation. And that's normally, depending on the country, something for the national competence. Um, international levels, we have, of course, to agree on the limits, the, the burden sharing, let's see, such as in the Paris uh, Accord. We need to decide who can, how much can we let out and how do we share, share the burden. And we also need to make sure that avoiding rebound in different ways, we just that we just not export the problem to somewhere else, for instance. So, so th there are, this concept has consequences on all the various level of governance, I think. Um, ah, this one was coming back. Oh, let's see. No, and I want to end here uh, to invite you to go to our uh, dedicated sufficiency website where you can find the reports, you can find some other external resources. And um, we, we hope, now we have no more funding, but we hope to be able to continue this work uh, some, somehow anyway. But um, the, the site is there and a lot of information is there and, and uh, I enjoy, hope you will, Go there and look and find and and uh, find what we have useful and and, and uh, enjoyable. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nid. Thank you for this inspiring speech. So I I note um, important words in uh, in your presentation. I mean. Words like, like behavior change, um, space design, interesting issue to investigate, and also um, sufficiency is not only individual but collective. So I I thank you for for your presentation very much. Um, now you. I propose I propose um, a new poll uh, on Slido for everybody. Um, so can you people join to Slido and answer to this question, please?
So which kind of individuals can help raise awareness on sufficiency? So maybe we forgot some kind of people. Syndrome. You can also take the floor to, to add So we have 14 answers. Uh, Marco had the kids, yeah, sure. Young people are the future. Um, but also elder people can be useful. Okay, thank you, everybody. So um energy agencies and architects for most of you and also schools public authorities a family um scientists colleagues at works not so useful so i do not have the analysis of this for the moment, but I think it's an interesting answers. Um, so it's just uh, the, the Q question and answers um, will be will take place at the end of the presentation. So after the presentations of uh, of our the two following speakers, if you don't mind. Um, so thank you everybody for answer mm -hmm. to the poll. Yeah. Perfect. So hi now the floor. Okay, thank you. And thank you again. And I give the floor to Julien Camacho from the Thank you, Marilor. Uh, everybody, uh, good, good morning, everybody. Sorry. Uh, so I'm Julien Camacho. I work for the French uh, Energy uh, Transition Network, which is a which is a, a, a national network uh, gathering uh, local energy agencies, uh, local authorities, and um, firms and and society that work on energy transition everywhere. Uh, on the French uh, territory. Uh, I, I'm in charge of the question of um, sufficiency um, and I'm, I'm going to, in my presentation, um, kind of uh, navigate between the thematic of uh, sufficiency that as, a, as, a, as, a, as a necessary um, uh, political um, question to address and um and between and, and the, the program that i i'm going to introduce to you which is called the click uh I, i'm sorry but I, I don't have a really a translation a good translation in english but it's something about uh supporting and um and um, um yeah supporting like particulars and individuals to change their behaviors uh, about uh, different um, behaviors like food, transportation, um, uh, housing, housing, energy, and so on. Uh, so I'm going to start in my presentation with something more general about sufficiency, and and we and it's very interesting because I was like really um, thoroughly listening, Niels before and we have some some things in in common and some other uh, things 
some other point of view, a little bit different, maybe because in France we like to address a lot of questions politically, but we, we are going to see forward. So I scroll my mouse <laughs> to see if it works. Yep. So maybe uh, some, some translation are not fortunate. Um, so I'll give a, a quick start uh, about, about the question of sufficiency, about the, the concept of sufficiency. Uh, we have in France um, an institute called Negawatt uh, that, that work on energy transition scenario uh, since early th uh, 2000s. And it's very interesting that uh, the scenario of energy transition shows that the first step is the one of sufficiency. It means we have to ask ourselves about our needs and then we can we can uh, discuss and we can choose how we can how we are going to answer and to uh, please those needs uh, but we have to admit that in our societies and our modern societies um, we start uh, backward so we first of all we try to um, develop renewable energy then we question the efficiency then Nowadays, uh, we address the question we, which would, should have been the first one, the one of sufficiency. Um, another graph on the right shows that, uh, unfortunately, we speak, we know that we we have to grow in within the limits of of and the boundaries of. Uh, of the planet, of the resources, natural resources. Um, we know that for 50, 60 years now, uh, we had in 2015 uh, the COP21 in Paris, and we choose to we choose to address and to um, plan for something very, very drastic, uh, a, a real shift that we we do not realize in in real life, uh, as I would say, because as we see there, uh, the global energy consumption on Earth continue to grow. So we are not changing, unfortunately. I'll try to go to the next one. Okay, it's like, 10 seconds reactive. Um, a, a real quick definition of energy sufficiency. Um, energy sufficiency is an approach to reduce global energy consumptions. Uh, it's a multi-approach multi, multi approach and it's very important to, uh, to understand that uh, and the, the, the answers we, we just give, gave just a few minutes ago on the poll shows us that, that sufficiency is not uh, a simple question. It's not a simple question where you can find simple answers. It's very, very political in, in the, very, um, um, the very etymological sense. It means that we have to discuss about it socially and collectively. Um, energy sufficiency is uh, attained by changing behaviors, lifestyles, and collective organizations. Uh, Niels sh just, just show, show it to us and, and say more or less the same thing. And the, the little point where I, I would not totally agree with Niels, it, it's about the fact that we have to insist that energy sufficiency is different of energy efficiency because it's been too long that we mix the both. And it's very important to us, I mean, for everybody to understand that the main problem of um, aiming the global reducing of, of uh, CO2, it's that 
we think that technology and techniques are going to resolve problems by attaining a certain amount of efficiency, a certain rate of efficiency, uh, which is not the case. It's obvious now. It's been 50, 60 years that we, um, we improve systems, technical, technique and technological systems, it doesn't work. So we really have to ask about our like collective needs before. Um, quickly to, um, it's, it's kind of interesting to um, uh, give some details about what what is sufficiency concretely? So, and Niels uh, talked about uh, the SUV, which is a very tricky point. Uh, uh, I mean, it's very, very, very hard to, to talk about it because it's something that it's um, more and more, uh, unfortunately, admitted in our society that now we have big uh, cars and we put 1.2 person into the cars uh, to uh, to do their day-to-day -day transportation. It's something that in our representations are uh, is normal, and and that's precisely what we have to we would say deconstruct. Um, so we have like here four dimensions, four way to uh, decline uh, what is uh, efficient uh, sufficiency. So we can we can work on dimensional sufficiency. So uh, it's a little bit provocative the picture I choose, of course, um, but it's 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 very 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 important. SUV is the the second uh, reasons why uh, global emissions continue to grow uh, to grow since the, the three last years. It's it's like a third of the cars market in the world. It's very very important. To address that politically and socially, uh, we have the structural sufficiency, which is connected, of course, with the dimensional. Uh, we make, and Nils said the same. Uh, we, we make roads and we make infrastructure um, to uh, to uh, in in relation, in connection with um, the the systems we use uh, to uh, to transport to. Uh, to live and to um, and to uh, achieve our needs, um, the user's sufficiency. That's where the program I coordinate um, take place and 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 focus. Uh, it's about use and, and behaviors. So it shows this picture shows the the lights uh, the lights are on during the night in Europe. A lot of little town and not cities, unfortunately, in France, but little town starts to uh, turn off the lights, the public uh, lights uh, during the night when nobody is in the street. Um, unfortunately, it's more and more uh, obvious with the, the COVID situation. And here, the collaborative sufficiency, uh, which shows that. Um, with the sufficiency, we have um, we th th there is a lot in question with the way we uh, uh, collaborate. We uh, share um, uh, we share the equipment, we share uh, objects, um, and we share spaces. And we have a lot of uh, energy to uh, save, um, adopting more collaborative uh, behaviors and systems. Of course, I'm not going to talk about just individual behaviors. I think you understand. Um, you might uh, you, you, you you might uh, have, have noticed that in France uh, one year ago, one year ago we have we had a kind of uh, social movement um, that we call the, the the yellow jacket. <laughs> so, uh, what I want to show you here is that. It's, it's sufficiency uh, have to, has to have with social fairness too. Uh, because as we talk about the, the need to reduce our consumption, it's very important to know what part of society 
is maybe uh, consuming more. And those these little graphs here more that shows that it's obvious that 10% of the population um, is in a way responsible of 50% of global emissions. It shows something that is obvious, that is uh, that is mechanic, mechanical in a, in a way, uh, is that uh, you consume where you have you have the possibility to consume, uh, but it shows that uh, it's it's really something about consumption. Uh, the question we have to to answer uh, to uh, to know what kind of society we we want of. Um, and that, those are like just a few examples, uh, which shows that uh, that shows that in 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 the region of Ile-de-France in in Paris, for instance, uh, we show that um, there there are really uh, big gaps between uh, part of the population. Uh, to me, it's very important to talk about that because you can't you can't really uh, support people in changing their behaviors without knowing where they come from where they come from and what uh, are their uh, life level and 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 also without understanding that some people can voluntarily uh, go towards sufficiency and uh, some other people uh, cannot do that because they're already in what we call in from in french uh, sobriété subie it means like suffered um, sobriety and i would use sobriety in this in this way because it's not volunteer i move forward um oh i didn't translate this one i forgot it uh au petit pas les petits effets it means we have an expression in france um you might have the same in english i guess but it's it, it's it's the little steps so uh, during a, during like 20 years, uh, we said we can change little by little uh, with the day-to-day -day behaviors and the little steps. Uh, but it's obvious that right now uh, the situation is is not just bearable. Uh, we have an emergency, and we we need to have the, those little individual steps at the same time dynamically. Uh, with the, the, the global political um, questions and regulation. Uh, but I, I'm not going to uh, comment it, this, uh, those graphs. Uh, more than that, uh, I will give you um, the reference. It's a French study which shows that um, two-thirds of the efforts to uh, attain sufficiency, to reduce half the consumption of, of of today, uh, energy consumption um, have to be um, have to be realized by uh, public authorities and and societies and firms, and not the not the individuals. Try to move forward. So um, now I'm going to talk more about what brings me today. Um, more precisely, which are the, I didn't translate this one into two, I'm sorry, <laughs> maybe I gave you the wrong one. Uh, the um, sufficiency, so I, I translate like right now, sufficiency challenges. Um, it's something that maybe well, uh, some of you know already because it was in 2008 a um, uh, uh, European uh, program, project, which was called uh, Energy Neighborhood. It takes. It took place in, I think, 16 countries in Europe, and in France it worked so well that uh, kind of, uh, an organization, a local organization, a local uh, energy agency uh, in the region of Haute-Savoie, uh, decided to um, to uh, continue and to um, spread the this this program and this uh, action uh, towards uh, France. And it was called Famille Energie Positive. Uh, if I brutally translate it, it means uh, Positive Energy Family. Um, 
And that's the program, the CLAIR, the organization I work for, um, uh, taking charge or, uh, since 2017. Uh, so we, I'm going to introduce you uh, the new aspect of the program and the, um, the goals that we gave to us to for the for the, the next development of the program. Uh, here you have different uh, challenges that exist in France. Zéro uh, déchet. It's it's more about uh, to reduce uh, garbage and and waste. Sorry. Défi uh, rien de neuf. Uh, it's a challenge about uh, not um, not uh, buying anything new during a year, which is a big, big challenge in our conception society, and on and on. This one is about transportation, this one is about food. So since 2008, uh, those challenges now uh, kind of little success in France. I scrolled my mouse, but I don't know if it worked. <laughs> Thank you. So here I wanted to show you what are um, what are um, the what is the proposition and how those um, challenge worked. Uh, we worked with local agencies and we work with local authorities uh, that, and those both work together in, in local territory. And the, the, the idea is to give them tools as a, as a web platform, for instance, as a pedagog pedagogical uh, and, and uh, support, communication support, and we, uh, we support them and we um, we uh, uh, transmit uh, a lot of um, methodological um, support uh, during during the period they they when they're going to uh, when they're going to uh, put actions into the program um, in order in local territory. So what is very important is that this is not Leclerc. Uh, nationally that um, kind of uh, support particulars and individuals. It's always local agencies and local authorities that, um, that uh, do that. So um, there are three main uh, access, three main um, ideas about those challenges. Uh, the first one is that it has to be on uh, um, kind of uh, long enough period to work. It's something uh, that that all the studies show is that you have to support people on period of several months to change behaviors. That's the first point, and and it costs money, of course, because you have to put uh, you have to put like professionals and 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 supports. Uh, to accomplish that. Uh, so that's the first point. The second uh, point is that you have to, uh, uh, you need, uh, you, you need um, skills and, and, and yeah, skilled people to support those uh, people to change their behaviors. And the third point, and which is quite important too, is that uh, the change of behavior works well and works uh, uh, is more efficient when you approach it with a collective uh, approach, uh, which means that uh, we um, we encourage local agencies and local authorities to organize collective challenges and not individual challenges, because it's something that also studies work uh, studies shows is that um, the the mimical, um, the mimical uh, effects mechanism uh, shows that people are more inclined to change the behavior when they see changing of behaviors in other people's life. So um, it takes a long time, that is what like. Uh, it's a social technical 
approach. So you need the technical uh, skills and the social skills to to support and encourage people. It's all about incapacitation and empowerment. So incapacitation is it's a bad translation. It's based on um, the concept of capabilities. Uh, so basically, it means that uh, instead of trying to change people's life, you give people the um, the power to change their own life, to choose how to change it, because they know the issue, they know the solutions, and they know how they can do that. Uh, so it's more a bottom-up uh, than a top-down uh, approach. Uh, collective and inclusive approach, and and the goal is to build a shared vision of changing lifestyles. Um, as Niels addressed it in, in his presentation, um, it can it can be for housing housing a very a very effective tool uh, to reduce the rebound effect when once uh, renovation work has been has been made. Uh, it's very important that the public policies um, to support and uh, to integrate those actions uh, in a very, in a more global view um, and not as little action during four or five months. So uh, it should be integrated in all public policies on the local area. Um, it's a way to provide tools uh, for uh, the coordinations of citizen transitions and uh, to massify um, the, the lifestyle change and it can be also a very interesting way to identify and uh, to empower uh, citizen initiatives on local territory. Now, so I'm going to pass quickly on this one. It's, those are results uh, challenge. I'm going I'm going to pass this one, otherwise I'm going to be a little bit too long and I don't want to speak more than that. Uh, it's more interesting to discuss all those um, questions. So that's kind of, um, it's, uh, those, those graphs shows that, and that's interesting, it's the same studies than I showed you before, but it shows that um, for individuals, uh, the most effective way to reduce uh, energy consumption uh, is in changing uh, their, their food behavior, first of all, then transportation, uh, then, um, then uh, consumption of uh, goods, and then at last, uh, housing. So, it's a kind of a answer of the first poll question. Uh, and most of people said at work, at home, it's probably in between. Uh, and then to uh, end my presentation and to go uh, forward to the end, um, I just want to show you what is exactly uh, that we proposed uh, with Declic. So Declic in French, so it's kind of maybe, uh, I don't know if the word exists in English, but it's like uh, a shifting. It's kind of uh, uh, -click. Um, it's a Declic. It's a quick change of mind and it's a quick swift, uh, shifting. Um, and uh, what we propose to uh, local authorities and local agencies is to access uh, to a web platform uh, that they'll be able to use to um, support uh, individuals in uh, actions to change their behavior about energy consumption in housing, about um, uh, waste um, and, and the way they manage waste uh, uh, domestically and uh, about water consumption in in the in house and uh, we are um, going to propose 
in 2021 um, way to measure uh, changing of behaviors in uh, alimentation, in food uh, behavior, and in transportation behavior too. So we are like developing uh, our platform and our uh, support uh, progressively. What is important is that this web platform is materialized. Uh, so we have one, one platform, one web platform that we uh, propose to share uh, between all local authorities and local agencies. We, we don't make no difference between local authorities and local agencies uh, and we give access both to both of them. Um, the idea is to construct together uh, a common, uh, common tools um, to, um, to support and uh, uh, to propose actions to change uh, individuals' behavior. And at some point, we, sh we would like that this platform uh, to be uh, a citizen platform too. I scrolled my mouse, but I don't know if it works. Thank you. Uh, those are little um, capture, a screen capture to show you um, how it works, but it's kind of complicated now, like um, to, to present it um, statistically. Um, so uh, the, the platform uh, allow uh, local authorities and local agency to organize challenges uh, to make those challenges uh, public on the platform and allows individuals to um, subscribe and to, uh, 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 to, to go and to, um, to participate to those challenges. Then um, we have a lot of tools to uh, measure uh, their housing energy consumption, their waste consumption, um, uh, and on and on. Uh, so, it's uh, at the same time uh, a web platform which can be used to publicize uh, challenges and informations and events um, for the challenges participants, but also for uh, all in, all the territory all the territory inhabitants, which is kind of interesting because um, we want. We want this platform to be uh, something kind of um, uh, a public tool uh, where uh, local actors can address uh, informations and propositions to all the inhabitants, not just participants of the challenge. Thank you. So I couldn't translate this one but it's, it, it shows what I try to explain, maybe not that clearly, but uh, what we propose is here in between uh, public actors. So what we call public actors is like local authorities, local agency, uh, the citizens, and uh, the organized non-governmental non society. Uh, and of course, society, uh, firms, and, uh, and what, what we want to propose is uh, this program, the CLIC, is something that can take place in between all those actors locally to be one more tool uh, to uh, attain uh, lifestyle changing and most of all to be um, also a support of democratic and politic political uh, discussion and, um, and confrontation uh, because, and I, that's going to be my conclusion, what is very important to understand, those are, those are uh, other initiatives uh, that can continue, that can uh, goes on after challenges and it's a way to include citizens in public and collective decision, political decisions, uh, which in my opinion is the most important part of 
supporting people in changing their behaviors and lifestyle. And that's why it's very, very hard to address the sufficiency question because sufficiency is not a technical uh, issue, is not a technological issue. It's, it's, um, it's most of all political and, 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 and we have to collectively uh, discuss about um, our needs and the way to uh, satisfy our needs. So uh, what we have to propose, and it's, it's a way to connect people together and make them discuss about their lifestyle and the way they, they could um, question their needs and satisfy them. Um, so to conclude, no form of sufficiency is based on efficiency. But some efficient solutions are more sober than others, than others to be agreed with Niels. Um, it's a way to question technological progress, of course, and the question of progress in general. Uh, that's, that's a question we have to address uh, when we talk about sufficiency. Um, it's very important to make the difference between voluntary sufficiency and suffered sobriety. That's why here, I, I kind of not use the same word. Uh, I use sobriety when it's suffered and I use sufficiency when it's uh, wanted. Uh, in, front, in French, we have only one word, so, sobriété. And, and yeah, in conclusion, it's, it's to uh, give the, the consumer the power to be a citizen and to choose uh, for, uh, <coughs> for the society and for the, um, the, the way he wants, we all collectively wants to answer uh, our needs. I, I think I'm a little bit too long, Marie-Laure, so I'm going to end here. Yes, please <laughs> conclude. Yes. Yeah, I'm concluding. You should have told me uh, it's not a question. I, I can stop right now. Can you please conclude? Yeah, I'm going. It's, it's over. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I would like to, to give the floor to Soren now. Um, and uh, Soren, I'm, I'm, I'm really confused, but um, Melissa, we will make, make the, the poll afterwards, if you don't mind. I prefer to give the floor to Soren right now. Please, Soren, in order to open the discussion on e-sufficiency. So, Soren, um, um, I know you, you don't have uh, slides to show, but it's, it's better now to have an open discussion, and we would like to, to have your, your things and ideas on, on this uh, uh, subject of sufficiency, please, Soren. Okay, so I'll try to be more analog in this uh, time of uh, of web meetings. Uh, I think uh, it it is a little bit hard to to kind of have the feeling of of everybody being on board when you have this uh, very isolated uh, position. But I think the the fish sufficiency efficiency discussion is quite interesting. I'm from the Samsø Energy Academy, and uh, I'm also from Samsø, which is an island in Denmark that uh, took on the challenge to be 100% renewable energy supplied uh, in 10 years. And, and for this, we had to talk about both efficiency and sufficiency uh, at the same time to do that. So I'll, I'll, I'll share some practical uh, lesson learned here and, and also some, some uh, examples of how we have navigated in, in the differences between the two. Um, I think what we've heard has been very inspiring and very informative also about uh, where you can find uh, um, evidence of, of sufficiency and uh, the, the lack of, of, of structure and architecture and planning and technical uh, installations and choices of how we use energy and, and where energy comes from and how it's then consumed. So I will focus on, on, on locality. So you could say that uh, basically... Uh, uh, can I see my own screen um, where I am? I can probably. Um, yeah, that's good. So I think 
I think what I like to do here is to share my screen and say, this is my island. You can see this is a map. I have this little brochure, so this is very analog. You can see we have a lot of uh, sim symbols or icons for wind power, for district heating, for transportation, for, for different so solutions in this. And this is, this is the result of a 10-year development that we have actually changed from imported oil to locally produced renewable energy. So job done. But how did you do that? How did you manage to talk about energy efficiency and sufficiency without getting lost in translation uh, about what is what and how do you do that? So you can say that we have an Excel sheet. I can see, I, I, you don't have to read this. It's just to say to you, we have these numbers. And the number game is just to say to you that we have worked with numbers year by year to identify where is on one page, where is on one side, what is what kind of fuels are we using for what? And over here, we have the consumption patterns. Where do we use it? Is it for space heating, for electric lighting? Is it for process? Is it for transportation or wherever is our resources used? And to do this, we have evaluated the quality of that in kind of a 10-year evaluation report that identifies the, the, the differences. Because if we don't know where energy comes from, then it doesn't really matter. And we, we, will, we will be confused about what is the mo in the priority of what to do here. We'll be confused about what is more important. So directly, you could say we are using so much energy. First, we need to talk about how do we save energy. So where do we find the lowest hanging fruit? Very often in, in households, space heating and, and domestic consumption of energy is very high. Why? Well, because we buy more and more appliances. We get more and more services, and we don't really think about the consequences on the energy bill uh, before we have to pay it. So, so we, we, we can exchange the TV screens, uh, but they will just grow bigger and we'll have more of them. They'll be more efficient, but all of a sudden they become cheap. So we have one in each room and one in the kitchen and one on the toilet sometimes. I don't know if you have one, but, but, but we change <laughs> patterns and, 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 and habits. Uh, while we are doing uh, efforts in, in changing the consumption pattern. So when you're on a, on a small island like on Samsung, you can connect your choice with the production. It's, it, it's very difficult in the city because you don't know where your energy comes from. So when you have to make these decisions, are we sure we have sufficient energy to support the consumption? We are the choice of our consumption. So we can connect the wind turbine in front of your windows with your consumption. Say to people, hey, you have, you have expanded your consumption. We need to put up more wind turbines in front of your windows. So this is your choice. You are actually co-responsible for the erection of the wind turbines. You might think that people love wind turbines on an energy island like Samsø, and we have a lot of them. I can, I, can, I can still prove that they are all over the island. We have them offshore and onshore and in big numbers. But People have a reluctance and they don't really like so many wind turbines because they take it takes the view and there's there's some resistance in this also. So the, the dialogue is between consumption and production. How much production do we need to cover what we need to have a good life? And I think these meetings are really interesting when we start talking about uh, sufficient energy enough to cover everything we need. And 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 this, this, is, this, is, this is an abstract discussion in the beginning, but it becomes very concrete because the, the, the connection, ownership, the responsibility for the system administration is all of a sudden the consumers more than it is if you live in a city where the electricity company or the power company far away, which is a distant bureaucratic system that is just sending you bills and, and providing you with the service you are paying for. Here, it becomes kind of a, an add-on to your life that you have to be co-responsible for the production and, and, and also the responsibility, uh, responsibility of the structure of the landscape is part of your, your, your system. I like the picture uh, Eric showed us with a building with a lot of, of uh, heat pumps behind it. We can, we can locally talk about this being inefficient, having an individual heat pump on every apartment in a, an apartment house. We will then say, would it be better? to go out and say, we make a district heating system, maybe on heat pumps, the same technology, but one big heat pump, and then supply all the houses in the neighborhood with energy from this facility. We can then also say, we change the imported oil or gas to heat the houses with wind turbine produced or wind produced electricity to the heat pump. 
So the heat, the wind turbine you see in the distance is part of your choice here again. So the rational choice is to make a more efficient centralized heat pump that sends energy out to all the houses in the neighborhood here also. And the house owners will then be responsible for this also because if you are consuming more than the heat pump can supply, then all the, the rest of the households will suffer from cooler uh, indoor conditions in the house here also. So you also have to communicate from house to house in a social relation where you are responsible for the administration of the production because the consumption is kind of connected to the production directly. So this is just my introduction to this also and, and for the conversation in, 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 the, in, the, in the ongoing forum here, I, I'd like just to stress that what, what we've heard from the two previous speakers here is kind of just in line with what I think, it's very good. So I don't wanna add on more to that, but just say to them that the human element or the, 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 the what do you call it, the behavioral element of your society is really interesting to put these two elements of efficiency and sufficiency to it. Efficiency is that you are aware of your own role as a consumer to, to be as efficient as possible because it serves a higher purpose, namely it, it improves the climate and at the same time it reduces the, the need of production capacity, which is also good. That saved money already there. You can maybe bring down 20% without really feeling it because you're just administrating better. It can be a smart energy system and can be many different things, more efficient centralized administration. But on the production side, I think we have been left out because we have these big units that's just producing here. And that's a business case where we are the customers. So there's not a direct inspiration for the producers to reduce their production because they live from this. This is where they have their livelihood and they, their bread and butter comes from selling you electricity. So they like you to have more appliances and use more energy, which is kind of a contradiction in our work with the climate, the, the climate change here also. So I'll leave it with that for the discussion because these are open-ended uh, things here also. But just say to you that we solved this in just 10 years, which is kind of maybe nice and easy because it's a small island. We invested more than maybe 70, 80 million uh, euros worth of energy installations. And at the end of the day, everybody is saving money because uh, the, the, the change from imported oil to locally produced energy is, is changing the economic pattern from, from a linear import economy to a circular economy where we actually are now keep the money in circulation and on the island. And we can talk about the next, which is maybe storage or electric ferries or other new technologies that we can improve this, uh, the project with. So thank you for now and let's uh, have the discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Sorin. Um, you, 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 you point an important issue. Um, I, I think um, um, very interesting that responsibility. That's very, very interesting. Uh, is that maybe because uh, in your island um, you have it's um, it's easy, easier to be that the consumption is connected to the, the the production and so on. And so this concept of responsibility is very important uh, in uh, in the in the sufficiency uh, issue also. Uh, so I think that is very uh, very interesting. And also the, the, the you pointed also the, the awareness uh, very important uh, items also responsibility and awareness. We can add this to to the to the previous presentation. So thank you, Soren, to open the discussion. Um, um, we have um, we have a reaction uh, from Neriman, but Neriman has a problem with the, the micro and so on. Uh, so maybe we will we will keep this for the for the report of uh, of this. Um, do you, um, Nils, wants to answer to uh, to Soren, or maybe maybe Julien, or you want to interact with the, the three, the three of you, and maybe someone wants to take the floor. So feel free to to ask for a question. Um, I guess that's it, this uh, concept of it's not a concept now, but the sufficiency, it's, it's not, uh, what's not so easy to understand, but I hope that uh, we had, uh, we, we, 
we succeed to to explain it uh, better to to everybody um, someone wants to yes philip thanks a lot thank you for these presentations very very interesting and i'm quite new to the to the concept of energy uh, sufficiency sorry um <laughs> so it was quite interesting to see the uh, various elements but i still have a couple of questions that might help me wrap my head, head around about um, the concepts and the actions that uh, flow from it. So first of all, uh, there, uh, this question is for all the all the speakers we've had so far. Um, what I understand is that changing the behavior of the individuals of the users is one of the key objectives of energy sufficiency of the energy sufficiency concept. But my question is, what about the industry? Is it as well a target of these sufficiency efforts? Uh, and uh, I know Nils, you mentioned it at some point that through product, sustainable product policy and maybe eco designs, there can be made efforts there as well. Because users and consumers are one part of the story, but the industry is as well, uh, needs to make an effort on uh, in this uh, endeavor. So this would be my one question. And uh, I have a second question as well um, that um, uh, is a little bit more delicate. It's regarding developing countries. Billions around the world are living in energy poverty and some of them live in certain countries, in developing countries that are finding a new, you know, a new, thanks to a no new economic growth, such as uh, we can see in Eastern Europe, are falling into a different type of consumption that is overconsumption. Um, how can we promote sufficiency from a communications point of view, from a strategic communication point of view, promote energy sufficiency and responsible behaviors to such countries where the promoters of this concept of sufficiency are from, you know, Western developed countries that have lived for decades in, we can call it energy excess or an energy decadence. How can we take this message and try to promote it and, and embed it also in policies there? So is there, are there good practices about it? It's, uh, I don't see exactly how we can successfully do it. Yeah, so these are my two questions. Thank you, Philip. Oops. I, I I would like to respond to one uh, very quickly, and and uh, knowing we are running short of time. Uh, first, theoretically, you could say that behavior mustn't be a part of sufficiency. I think it I think it has realistically, but you could say that you could regulate things. For instance, like the eco design is not a behavioral thing as such; is rather a policy approach to to uh, do a regulation that you have to stick to. Whereas in you, if you introduce it in labels, then again, it reflects to energy efficiency. So there's two, two behavioral uh, aspect, aspects. But, but I, I also think that it's very hard to separate one from the other. For instance, I think with CERN is an excellent example, and I, I like that very much, because when you create the conditions for individual uh, consumers or citizens, to act uh, according to to this, um, let's say, uh, call it sufficiency or efficiency, then it's easier to do it because you see the link. And and you gave certain a very good example of when you just buy energy on the market, of course you see no connection. You expect it all to be available anytime you just buy more because you don't see the consequences of what buying more need, means to you. But in on some sir. You just can't say I want to buy more because it has a, a real consequence, and I think that's that's a, a, a very very I think it's a super clear illustration of of, of two ways of looking for it. And and at some sense I don't even think sufficiency is relevant. In in that sense, you don't even have to think about sufficiency because it's something deeper. You know that it, that's when you analyze it, it. It is energy sufficiency, but you simply know that. If I want more, there are consequences. Period. Basically, those things. And and I I, I wonder, and I don't know how. I haven't wrapped my head around how we can connect this with a larger society where things are not so direct, where we have markets, where we can import, we can fly fresh fruit from Latin America to Europe. Then, 
we don't really see the consequences and and that's very very difficult and and that is a really big challenge i don't have your i don't have my my um i don't have the answer to that and the other thing i would like to say is that for companies i think that's really an important thing and to me that's the biggest challenge for companies to find business models where they don't necessarily have to sell more and more and more but to sell because I still think it's, it's a legitimate goal for a company to earn money, but you then need to find a way to earn money without just you know uh, doing unsustainable things. And that's a, a big challenge. And unfortunately, a lot of the research has not been going so much into businesses. It's much more concentrated on, on citizens and policymakers. And I'm really interested in trying to see how can companies find ways business models that are compatible with an energy sufficiency uh, way of, of, of living I, I don't know exactly well, I mean there are some niche companies today that you know, recycle food or, or different things okay thank you, thank you Nils Seren, Julien do you want to answer to or add something to it. I think I think one of the one of the findings here is so that if if you are if you are very close to ownership or to to what you call it the public information about this also then it's easier to understand uh, the connection. You could also say we could actually operate with a system where we had 20% more energy than we need. So 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 we we have an export economy where we produce. Uh, abundant amounts of energy and and therefore we can say when it's windy we can actually we can let the light be on and we can use as much energy as as we need when it's renewable and not, not harming the environment uh, this this is a choice we can discuss where, where we in a, in a very controlled system cannot discuss the consequences of anything here also we can just be told that it has a negative consequence for the climate or uh, it'll be put on your bill here so 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 Addressing this to to to, in, to industry is is quite interesting because I think a lot of Danish industry has has learned from high carbon taxes on energy consumption, which is kind of the way to treat its sticks and carrot. We have a high carbon tax educating consumers to use less, and this money will then be redirected into green investments. So if a company behaves, uh, saves energy, they can at the same time actually ask for support or funding for new installations or new technologies used in their production plants because that is part of the the green deal uh, in Denmark and probably also will be in the future so so if you ask Danish industry I think they think they they would say it's a market uh, competitive uh, situation to be efficient to produce products at a very low energy cost uh, because this will it, it has a market lead in itself but it is also teaching us to kind of administrate uh, the cost of producing things here uh, because energy is part of the production cost. So, so it's optimizing industry in, a, in the most possible way here. If you, in, like in America and other places, keep energy prices low, then there's no driver, there's no stick to educate the industry in, in, in having a, a more efficient way of using uh, energy. And as long as you pump enough oil and dig enough coal, then there's abundant amounts of this also, so nobody cares. Uh, but this shouldn't, I mean, this shouldn't, shouldn't be part of the future, but, but part of a paradigm we are all facing with the UN declaration and Paris and everything we have, we have agreed on. Uh, and hopefully also uh, after the day after tomorrow, uh, uh, value for, for, for America. So we can do this uh, in, in a corporate way. But it's just to say that I think uh, this this dialogue is happening while we're speaking, but 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 we need to address it at a higher level so people know what where where it is so we can make choices that that helps these situations. Okay, thank you, Soren. Julia. Uh, yes, yes, uh, um, I, I do agree with everything that has been said uh, before, uh, but uh, just just. I have to insist on the fact that sufficiency uh, has to be politic, has to be, has to be, to be a political question, and and we we do not have uh, that that we do not have spaces. We do not have um, it. It question also the the way democracy works today, and the the, the connection between 
um, democracy, industry, and, and um, the lifestyles. Uh, everything is connected. It's, it's what is very, very difficult uh, to understand, to, um, to, yeah, to answer the question of sufficiency. And, and maybe we should not talk about sufficiency, but uh, development model and 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 um, and development indicators, um, wealthness, wealth, uh, yeah, wealthness indicators like GPD. We should also change our point of view, our representations about what is uh, growth, what is development, what is um, and it's it's it goes in the same way that Soren uh, that what Soren say. Uh, we could decided um coercively like to um, to uh, introduce uh, negative externalities of companies of production of goods and wealth into the prices then we would have the real ecological impact of everything we produce and then you should you should think twice before to to buy a laptop which would cost maybe 3,000 euros because that's the real price. That's the real ecological, social, environmental, and very multiple uh, prices of, of the, the goods. So that's, that's an answer. But the, the, the eco design is also something very important because the same laptop to be sustainable should last maybe 30 years. And if you keep one 10 years, it's already something great. I mean, we are we are in this society where energy is cheap. And it's been 60 years that we over consume it, and that's we have to change it. And, and it won't come from the top. It what it won't come only from the bottom. It has to be something in between, and that's what we should call, we should call I, know, I don't know, politic, democracy, maybe something. There's, there's something interesting in the French um, uh, climate, climate Citizen Convention. I don't know if you guys follow that, but uh, 150 people choose in the population and addressing uh, political issues about transition, energy transition, and they asked for some some things very very strong from very strong changes, uh, and we we will we will see in the future if our like president and government um, choose to be inspired by the measures adopted. Well, I think we should close the the webinar uh, now since everyone has other meetings and uh, lunch to attend. I guess Marie-Laure, can you can you say the the word of the end? Yeah, she lose the connection now. It's back, I think. Ah, oh, yeah, Marie-Laure. Marie-Laure. Euh, oui, alors j'ai été déconnectée pendant une minute là. Donc sur la fin de ce que disait euh... Euh, Nils, Nils and um, Soren left the meeting. So I think okay. you can conclude now. Yes, we can conclude. On va conclure with the poll. I think right, I all right. to, to tell you that we, uh, just a minute. I would like to add that we will put this uh, uh, the recording on uh, on the website, and I think it could be nice to open a discussion with uh, more people. Okay. So you want to do the last poll still, Marie-Laure? Oh, the, the last poll, yes, please, because you you managed to. Okay. We lost a few people on the way, but. <laughs> Any last poll? Okay, thank you, Melissa. Just before saying goodbye.
Non, oui, it's okay, Julien. We are not so long, but um, maybe it's one hour and a half, it's too short. Maybe we could sing about two hours for this uh, kind of webinar. Okay, thank you. So education awareness are the most important means for the Okay, and after that's fine and it's penalties for by subsidies and media advertising. Okay. So we will conclude. It's not really a con it's a, a first conclusion um before this this second webinar we will take place on the 9th of december uh at the beginning was the 8th of december but dominic told me that it is uh, the, the 8th of december is a uh, is not a good day because uh it's a uh, it's an holiday for some it's a good country. holiday in some countries yeah mm -hmm. okay so it's in, in, on 9th of december so we will uh, we will um, continue on energy efficiency uh, with example dealing with the mobility and uh, with public space but i guess that uh, we will continue to have discussion on uh, what is uh, sufficiency and also what's the importance what is the place of sufficiency in the energy transition policy so thank you to all our speakers uh, thank you for Julien, you are the next, the, the last one. Thank you uh, for the preparation, for the for all the contents you, you share with, with us this morning. And uh, we hope to see you uh, in December, in December. And thank you also to Federen for all the works. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you thank you, Marilla. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.